Information Architecture 4th Edition. Louis Rosenfeld, Peter Morville, and George Arango. Recap of Chapter 1. Throughout history, information has shown a tendency to dematerialize, going from having a one-to-one -one relationship with its containers, to our digital information which is completely detached from its containers. This has had two important effects in our time, information is more abundant than ever before, and we have more ways of interacting with it than ever before. Information architecture is focused on making information findable and understandable. Because of this, it is uniquely well suited to address these issues. Information architecture addresses these issues by asking the designer to think about problems through two important perspectives, that our products and services are perceived as places made of language, and that they function as ecosystems that can be designed for maximum effectiveness. That said, information architecture doesn't operate solely at the level of abstractions, for it to be effective, it needs to be defined at various levels. Recap of Chapter 2 There's more than one way to define information architecture, and that's okay. Information architecture is not something you can easily point to. It is mostly abstract and exists below the surface, in the deep semantic structures of products and services. This is okay, too. Our model for practicing effective information architecture design considers three things, users, context, and content. 36 Chapter 2, Duh. Ning Information Architecture www.itabooks.info The particular mix of variables changes not just from one information environment to another, but also for a single information environment over time. As we mentioned in the introduction to Part I, IA is focused on making information environments findable and understandable. These are related, but different, objectives. In the next chapter, we'll look more closely at designing for findability. Onward. Recap of Chapter 3, IA starts with people and the reason they use your product or service, they have an information need. There are different models of what happens when people look for information. The most simple of these is problematic because it doesn't accurately represent what actually happens when people have an information need. Information needs are like fishing, sometimes people know exactly what they're looking for, but often they're casting a wider net. People act on these information needs through various information-seeking behaviors. There are various research methods that allow us to learn about these behaviors. Now that we've learned about how people find information, let's move on to IA's second big goal. How People Understand Information Recap of Chapter 4 This structure of information environments influences more than how we find stuff, it also changes how we understand it. We experience information environments as places where we go to transact, learn, and connect with other people, among many other activities. When designing information environments, we can learn from the design of physical environments. Some organizing principles that carry over to information environments from physical environments include structure and order, rhythm, typologies, and modularity and extensibility. As you may have surmised at this point, finding and understanding are not really separate goals, they are flip sides of the same coin. The way we understand an information environment he context it sets information influences how we find information in it, and vice versa. The organizational structure of the environment is a critical factor in influencing how people make sense of what they can do there, and the information they hope to find and produce when participating in the environment. In any case, we hope we've done a good job of setting the stage. We now move on to part two of the book, in which we explore the basic principles by which information architecture achieves these aims. Recap of chapter four. This structure of information environments influences more than how we find stuff, it also changes how we understand it. We experience information environments as places where we go to transact, learn, and connect with other people, among many other activities. When designing information environments, we can learn from the design of physical environments. Some organizing principles that carry over to information environments from physical environments include structure and order, rhythm typologies, and modularity and extensibility. As you may have surmised at this point, finding and understanding are not really separate goals, they are flip sides of the same coin. 
The way we understand an information environment he context it sets information influences how we find information in it, and vice versa. The organizational structure of the environment is a critical factor in influencing how people make sense of what they can do there, and the information they hope to find and produce when participating in the environment. In any case, we hope we've done a good job of setting the stage. We now move on to part two of the book, in which we explore the basic principles by which information architecture achieves these aims. Recap of chapter five, you'll probably need to explain information architecture to others, so it's important that you help them visualize it. You can visualize information architecture from the top down or from the bottom up. There are various ways of categorizing IA components, but here we'll be looking at four categories, organization systems, labeling systems, navigation systems, and searching systems. And now that we've given you the overview of the basic systems we'll be discussing, we'll dive into the first of them, organization systems. Recap of Chapter 6, Our Understanding of the World is Informed by How We Classify Things. Classifying things is not easy. We have to deal with ambiguity, heterogeneity, differences in perspective, and internal politics, among other challenges. We can organize things using exact organization schemes or ambiguous organization schemes. Exact organization schemes include alphabetical, chronological, and geographical groupings. Ambiguous organization schemes include topical, task-based, audience-based, metaphorical, and hybrid groupings. The structure of organization schemes also plays an important role in the design of information environments. Social classification has emerged as an important tool for organizing information in shared digital environments. Now let's move on to cover another critical component of an information architecture, labeling systems. Recap of Chapter 7, We Label Things All the Time. Labeling is the most obvious way to show your organization schemes across multiple systems and contexts. We must try to design labels that speak the same language as our environment's users, while also reflecting its content. Textual labels are the most common type we encounter in our work. They include contextual links, headings, navigation system options, and index terms. Iconic labels are less common but the widespread adoption of devices with less screen real estate means that they are an important component of many information environments. Designing labels is one of the most difficult aspects of information architecture. That said, there are various sources of inspiration such as your existing information environment and search log analysis hat can help inform your labeling choices. Let's now move on to Chapter 8 where we'll dig into one of the mainstays of effective information architectures, navigation systems. Recap of Chapter 8 We use navigation systems to chart our course, determine our position, to find our way back. They provide a sense of context and comfort as we explore new places. The surface layer of navigation hat people actually interact with s changing very fast. There are various types of navigation systems. Three common ones are global, local, and contextual systems. The tools we use to explore information environments such as web browsers provide their own navigation mechanisms. Building context allowing users to locate their positions within the system is a critical function of navigation systems. Global navigation systems are intended to be present in every page or screen in the information environment. Local navigation systems complement global ones and allow users to explore the immediate area where they are. Contextual navigation systems occur in context of the content being presented in the environment and support associative learning by allowing users to explore the relationships between items. There are also various supplemental navigation systems we can use, such as setemaps, indexes, and guides. And now, we move on to search systems which allow people to find what they are looking for in your information environment. Recap of Chapter 9, Search is an important mechanism for finding information. However, it's not a given that your information environment requires a search system. Although search may appear simple as type some words into the search box here's a lot going on under the hood. Choosing what to index in your information environment is an important step when configuring your search system. 
there are many different types of search algorithms. There are also various different ways of presenting results back to the user. All of these factors had to search, what to retrieve, and how to present the results home together in the search interface. Now we move on to discuss the final principle in our overview, the SORI, controlled vocabularies, and metadata. Recap of Chapter 10 The SORI, controlled vocabularies, and metadata operate on the back end of an information environment to enable a more seamless and satisfying experience on the front end. Metadata tags are used to describe documents, pages, images, software, video and audio files, and other content objects for the purposes of improved navigation and retrieval. Controlled vocabularies are subsets of natural language, and include synonym rings, authority files, classification schemes, and the SORI. These systems allow you to structure and map language so that people can more easily find information. Faceted classification and polyarchy allow you to make information available in more than one way, allowing people to find their own routes to the stuff they're looking for. With this look at the SORI, controlled vocabularies, and metadata, we conclude the basic principles part of the book. Now that you know the basic components that constitute an IA, we can see how these systems come together to produce effective and engaging information environments. Recap of Chapter 11 Good research means asking the right questions, and choosing the right questions requires a conceptual framework of the broader environment. We use our content context user's conceptual framework as the basis of our research. When researching context, we're looking to understand goals, budgets, schedules, technology infrastructure, human resources, corporate culture, and politics. When researching content, we're looking to understand the stuff in your information environment. When researching users, we're looking to understand the people eel, living human beings who will be using your information environment. It can sometimes be difficult to convince stakeholders to include time for research in the project, but it's important that they do so. Now let's examine the next step of the process, strategy. Recap of Chapter 12 an information architecture strategy serves as a bridge between research and design. The IA strategy provides a high-level conceptual framework for structuring and organizing an information environment. You should start considering possible strategies for structuring and organizing the product before research begins. The main deliverable of the strategy phase is the strategy report. We find it useful to create a project plan for the design of the information architecture as part of the strategy phase. You're not done when you've created the report you also need to present and discuss it with stakeholders. Now that you know how to develop and organize the strategy for your information architecture, let's discuss how the strategy can shape your design. Recap of Chapter 13 In the design phase, the emphasis of the project moves from process to deliverables tease where the information architecture starts to become manifest. That said, these deliverables aren't the whole story. Rosas is as important during this phase as it is during research and strategy. Information architectures are abstract and conceptual, which makes it difficult to capture them in diagrams. You should provide multiple views of your information architecture to display its different aspects. These views should be developed for specific audiences and needs. IA diagrams define content components and the connections between them. SATEMIPS show the relationships between information elements such as pages and other content components, and can be used to portray organization, navigation, and labeling systems. WIRA frames depict how an individual page or template should look from an architectural perspective. Content models support contextual navigation that works deep within the product. Controlled vocabularies can be conveyed with metadata matrices and applications that enable the vocabulary to be managed. As you move through the design phase, you'll find yourself collaborating more with other people involved in developing the product and open mind and good collaboration tools are essential. A recap of what you have learned. So with that bit of introspection out of the way, let's recap what we've learned in this new edition of the Polar Bear book. In part I, we introduce the challenges that information architecture can help us address, information overload and contextual proliferation. We tackle these challenges by thinking about the products and systems that we design as information environments, 
or places made of language. Users interact with these information environments in various different contexts using different channels of access, and their experience of the environment needs to be coherent between these channels. In order to do so, designers need to think about the solutions comprehensively, as part of a system. The outcome we're aiming for is information that is easier to fit and understand. Design for finding is about structuring information so that it can meet people's information needs, so we learn about information-seeking behaviors, as developed in the field of library sciences. Design for understanding is about creating a context that presents information in a way that it makes sense to people, so we learn about placemaking and organizing principles derived from the field of architecture. In part second, we discussed basic principles that allow us to structure information for better findability and understandability. We discussed different ways of organizing information environments, including exact and ambiguous organization schemes, hierarchies, structured databases, and free-form hypertext systems. We learned about the importance of labeling, the words we use in links, headings, and more. We learned about the various types of navigation and search systems, and about invisible systems that the user doesn't directly perceive, such as metadata, the sorry, and faceted classification schemes. In part third, we learned about the process of designing an information architecture that brings these principles together. We broke this process down into three distinct activities, research, in which the team attempts to understand the problem s they're solving for, strategy, in which they synthesize a comprehensive solution, and design and documentation, in which they give the solution form and convey it to the various people responsible for the production of the information environment. Do we believe this particular content and structure represent the final word in what information architecture is and how it can help make information more findable and understandable? No, we do not. As with all information architectures, there is more than one way to go about it. That said, this one feels good to us. It has the advantage of having evolved over time to respond to the changing needs of designers, their clients, and the broader context of practice. We fully expect that information architecture will continue to evolve as information environments get richer and more complex in the years to come.